there are four JAK inhibitors that are approved in the U.S. Ruxolinib in 2011, Fidratinib in 2019, Picritinib in 2022, and Mamalotinib in 2023. They're all type 1 JAK inhibitors. They share all one thing in common, which is they inhibit JAK2, but then to varying degrees, they hit other enzymes in the kinome profile, whether it's JAK1 in the case of mamalotinib and ruxolinib, um, or other off-target um, enzymes that might improve outcomes like anemia, for example, ACBR1 in picritinib and mamalotinib. Um, so there are different, there are similarities and differences, but they're all type 1 inhibitors. So they all inhibit the ATP um, kinase portion of the enzyme. And therefore, in general, they are um, very effective in reducing spleen and symptoms, but they don't necessarily selectively target and deplete the, the malignant stem cell clone. So the disease does persist, and eventually patients will lose response to these drugs in most cases. So although they are for sure a great addition to the armamentarium, and in, in my career, I've, I've watched this field change dramatically um, due to the advent of these drugs, there, there's more that needs to be done. The next generation of JAK inhibitors right now, um, well, there's a drug called Jactinib, which is um, coming from China, uh, which is a JAK1-2 inhibitor and ACBR1 inhibitor. But I think that the ones that are really in the spotlight right now in 2025 are, are two drugs. Uh, one is by um, Ajax, um, which is a, um, it's 11095. It's a type two JAK inhibitor. So it binds differently um, and inhibits both the on and off um, uh, JAK2 protein. So preclinically, it is a very potent JAK inhibitor. It's able to overcome JAK2 inhibitor um, signaling resistance from prior type 1 JAK inhibitor. So it, it holds the, the potential of having a more profound effect on the disease process um, and we are soon to find out whether that is coming along because it's a it's a phase one dose escalation study. We will see data at ASH 2025, at least preliminary data on the dose escalation, safety, tolerability, and some efficacy data. So we look forward to seeing that. But right now we don't have uh, commercial um, uh, uh, publicly available um, data on this um, type two inhibitor. The other JAK inhibitor that's worth mentioning is a JAK2 V617F selective inhibitor by Insight. This is also in phase one dose escalation, also with very compelling preclinical data, um, slightly different in that it binds the pseudokinase domain with where the JAK2 V617F mutation is. So this one is actually specific for JAK2 mutated patients, I should point out, whereas the Ajax 11095 type two inhibitor is agnostic to JAK2 uh, mutation status. The type, uh, the, the JAK2 V617F selective inhibitor by Insight essentially changes the conformation of the enzyme and reverts it back to a wild type or normal uh, JAK2 protein. So um, it holds the, the potential of reversing the uh, mutated phenotype to a, a normal phenotype um, and changing the disease process, potentially even reducing the malignant clone over time. Um, Again, we don't have publicly available data with this drug either, so we're anxiously awaiting to see what the preliminary results look like in terms of safety and efficacy. And the big question is, will these drugs be effective but challenging to provide if they are associated with significant myelosuppression, which is always one of the concerns when you effectively target JAK2, um, as JAK2 stat signaling is important for normal hematopoiesis as well. Well, I guess the, the main one is cure. Um, right now, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is the only modality that offers the potential to cure patients, which is probably utilized in 10% of myelofibrosis cases. So we have 90% of patients with myelofibrosis that are really being managed to address spleen and symptom to try to improve anemia, which are not unimportant goals, but the ultimate goal of our research community is to be able to effectively target and eliminate the uh, mutant clone in order to allow for normal hematopoiesis and restore normalcy of lifespan. Um, so that's really, to me, the, the, the ultimate um, unmet need. Building upon the platform that we have of these effective um, type 1 JAK inhibitors, it would be great to have 
uh, a next generation of JAK inhibitors that can uh, be given safely with you know minimal to no myelosuppression with uh, more profound activity on the clone and maybe even the ability to modulate the disease and demonstrate clear um, uh, changes in um, disease course and, and progression. So, um, you know, more effective JAK inhibitors would be welcome. I, I don't think we really need more ME2 type 1 JAK inhibitors at this point, um, but I would definitely welcome a new type of JAK inhibitor, whether it's going to be a type 2 or, or a V617F specific inhibitor that can induce deeper responses that then lead to better progression-free survival, durability of response, and ultimately overall survival. We're talking about JAK2 inhibitors, but I do want to point out, particularly for the patients out there that are mutant Kalar bearing, that we do have mutant Kalar specific um, therapeutics in development, whether it's the inside antibody, the Janssen uh, bispecific T-cell engager, um, or um, there are uh, vaccines like we have here that are, are really targeted um, immunotherapeutic approaches to treating Kalar that are really exciting with already preliminary data demonstrating uh, both safety and, and efficacy and molecular responses with the um, Insight um, 033989 uh, monoclonal antibody that was presented um, at EHA as a late-breaking abstract. So I, I'm really excited by the future of both molecularly targeted JAK2 mutant um, therapies as well as mutant CalR and hopefully eventually uh, mutant MPL-directed therapies.